Welcome to Yasser Arafat, his legacy with me, Chris Banbury. Ten years ago, on 10th of November 2004, Yasser Arafat died in a Paris hospital. Even in death, he remained a controversial figure. Officially, he died of illness, but there is a growing belief he was poisoned. Naturally, the finger of blame is pointed at Israel. Arafat was, of course, a leader of the first of the girl organizations, Fatah, then of the Palestine Liberation Organization. He went from championing an armed struggle to liberate Palestine to spearheading the attempt to create a two-state solution, recognition of Israel in return for the creation of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and Gaza. What Arafat achieved is a subject of debate, but there is no doubt about one thing. He became the very symbol of Palestine and its resistance. Joining me to discuss Arafat's legacy are Kevin Ovenden, an organizer for Viva Palestina, who was aboard the Turkish vessel boarded by Israel forces in 2010 off Gaza, in which 10 people died, and Martin Winston, a former MP and editor of Palestine Briefing. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Uh, the first question I'd like to ask is uh, Yasser Arafat founded Fatah, which began the armed resistance to the Israeli state in the wake of the defeat of the 1967 war. How significant was that, Martin? Well, he was the, he was the savior of the Palestinian nation. Uh, I mean, the Ben-Gurion's theory when, when, uh, after Israeli independence was that uh, the Palestinians would not forget, their sons would not forget, but their grandchildren would forget, and they would just melt away into the surrounding countries. Um, and it was Arafat who, uh, more than anybody else, uh, proved them wrong, because he awakened, you can't, you can't say he kept the flame alive, he created the flame of Palestinian nationhood, and, and uh, he, he uh, nursed it through uh, two or three very difficult decades before they came to uh, the stage where they, um, uh, in 1988, where they recognized Israel and they accepted uh, what they hoped would be a two-state solution. Um, but uh, it was Arafat who, who, who uh, really created that. I don't say he created the Palestinian nation. The nation always existed, but it didn't really have a sense of nationhood uh, until um, until the Israel was created and uh, the Israelis tried to do away with the Palestinian population. And the launching Kevin, of the armed struggle back in the wake of that defeat in 1967, it was very important, wasn't it? It was. In the Fatah had launched its first operation in, on the 1st of January 1965 within uh, occupied Palestine, but the operation at Karameh in March of 1968, which was on Jordanian territory, was the first defeat that the Israeli army had suffered since the formation of Israel in 1948, and certainly, of course, since the disaster of the June War, the Six-Day War of 1967, which brought the humiliation of Arab regimes of all stripes, Jordanian, Syrian, and Egyptian. Uh, it meant the humiliation of the, the greatest Arab nationalist figure, President Nasser, who resigned and was brought back by popular acclaim. And so this really propelled uh, Fatah, Yasser Arafat and the Palestinian cause back into consciousness across the Arab region. There was a great danger at this point between 68 and 1970 that with the retreat of the high tide of Arab nationalism, which had come in the wake of, the, uh, of 1948 and the decolonization movements, that the Palestinian struggle could be left beached and, as Martin put it, that Ben-Gurion's uh, hope could be, could be realised, that the first generation would die out, the second generation would forget and the third would never, would never know. That didn't happen because of the resistance by Fatah. And then uh, there's also a very important decision which is unique, specific to Yasser Arafat, which is that in 69 he decided that the PLO, which up to that point had been an ineffective, largely cultural lobbying organisation, could be revolutionised to become a true uh, umbrella and national representative body of the Palestinian struggle, which is what he did. Now, Martin, in 1974, Nasser Arafat, Yasser Arafat famously went to the United Nations General Assembly in New York to deliver a speech where he said, I hold in one hand the olive branch and the other the freedom fighter's gun, don't let the, don't let this, uh, don't let the olive branch fall. I mean, how significant a moment was that? Well, uh, 
I remember it as a, as a very significant moment because uh, it wasn't just the Israelis trying to pretend that the Palestinians didn't exist. Most of the world preferred to believe that Palestinians didn't exist. That Golda Meir famously said, you know, there are no Palestinians, there is no Palestine. Uh, so it was very uh, important to establish, uh, uh, to establish their n claim to nationhood. And uh, yes, Arafat did that uh, so effectively. <coughs> I mean, the, the, the truth is that uh, once the Israelis had learnt that the Palestinians weren't going to forget, they thought that maybe, uh, if, that maybe that Yasser Arafat was the cause of all the trouble, and if they could get rid of Yasser Arafat, uh, people would forget again. But of course, that, that is also quite wrong. He was the person who raised the consciousness, but it was, it's a consciousness that has very deep roots. Uh, it, and as long as there are Palestinians, there will be uh, Palestinian nationhood. But uh, I think 1974 was a very important turning point, and it, it woke the world up to the existence of the Palestinian nation as a political unit, um, not, not just an ethnic and cultural unit. And yet, Kevin, there are those who argue that that speech also represented a break. Previously, the Fatah and the PLO were committed to a, a guerrilla struggle to liberate Palestine, and this was a new departure seeking a peace. Was it a, a, ch a shift? I don't think it was so much of a shift as, as some people make out, uh, largely because the, the guerrilla tactic of Fateh, oh, not just of Fateh, but of the Popular Front and of other Palestinian factions which were united under the PLO leadership at the executive level, at least until 1974, was exactly that. It was a tactic in, as, as a, a part of a wide-ranging strategy in which the Palestinian national liberation struggle was identified by virtually all of the Palestinian factions as part of the Arab revolutionary process more generally. Yasser Arafat's contribution, I think, at this point is, is crucially to maintain an orientation upon wider change throughout the Arab region in challenging historic British and French and then contemporary US hegemony, at the same time as, in a sense, nationalizing the Palestinian struggle. And that is, he did his very best uh, and continue to do his very best, we can discuss how successful he was, to prevent the Palestinian struggle from being simply a plaything of one or other Arab regime. And that was, that was a very difficult thing to do. I think 1974 represented an attempt to continue that policy, but in weakened circumstances. And Martin, the strange thing was that Arafat had become the very symbol of Palestine, even in the address, in every, in every way, and he'd become an international figure, a uh, really famous I mean, uh, figure. And yet, by the second half of the 1970s, the PLO had been forced out of Jordan. It would be in the 1980s forced out of Lebanon. I mean, these were difficult years, actually, for Arafat, particularly in the 1980s. And yet he survived. Was that, in a way, a victory? Yes, I think it was, because, uh, I mean, the, you have to remember that although um, at the time, people, uh, Israel portrayed itself as a very weak, small, uh, defenseless state surrounded by hostile neighbors. In fact, even then, it was militarily very, very strong, and it's, it was always very much stronger than the, the Palestinians. There was never a Palestinian army, uh, there was, uh, and Israel was in the process of acquiring the, one of the strongest armies in the, in the entire world. Uh, so that military imbalance uh, became very apparent from a very early stage, and, uh, and it was one thing to believe that, that the Arab countries, Saudi Arabia or Egypt, could take on Israel, although it turned out they couldn't. Um, but it w was quite another thing to believe that uh, a bunch of guerrilla fighters could take on this this state this w with a very well-trained, a very well-equipped army. And he, he, but he, he played the tactic of the classic liberation struggle to, to perfection. Uh, I mean, uh, when you have uh, when well, you have no army um, and, and you're taking on a country with a large army, uh, you need to win international support. You need to win. You need to win the moral battle, and and this is what um, what, what he did. Although he, uh, the technique, the the methods that were used often alienated people in the West. Nevertheless, it forced them to confront the, the fact that there was a Palestinian nation that was being uh, suppressed by the Israelis. And, and uh, in the same way that uh, ANC in, in, in South Africa went from being considered a very dangerous extremist a terrorist organization to being considered the voice of the South African, to being the government of South Africa, uh, Yasser Arafat took them along this route. And uh, of course, uh, it resulted in 
huge sacrifice, huge losses, uh, and uh, there were, you know, as Arafat himself uh, admitted, there were many, there were many mistakes made along the way. But the important thing is that that he uh, he started the process of um, awakening the conscience of the world to the plight of the Palestinian people and making it a moral issue rather than a military issue. I mean, he did survive through the 1980s, but at some price. Yeah, the entire Palestinian revolutionary movement uh, suffered one defeat after another. I mean, 1970 is Black September. 1976 is the Syrian intervention into the uh, Lebanese civil war, which was a left-right war, and this sectarianized the civil war and led ultimately to the uh, expulsion of the Palestinian resistance from Lebanon and then the, the disaster of uh, Sabra and Shatila in September of 19, 1982. And in Tunis, you have a Tunisian regime which is moving uh, just a few years behind the path of the, uh, the Egyptian regime in coming to terms with, uh, if not Israel directly, certainly with the United States, France and so on. So these are very, very difficult uh, times which lead up to the decision in 1988 and then to the decision uh, to embark on the Oslo process um, from a position of, of weakness. And it's not a weakness which I think primarily Yasser Arafat or the Palestinian struggle uh, should be held responsible for. It's, the, it's a weakness imposed by those in the Arab region who already had state power. You know, you have a Palestinian struggle which continues unabated, the plane hijackings and other uh, tactics and so on, throughout the 70s and into the 80s, winning international support, and yet Egypt and Jordan uh, two of the principal frontline states make a peace deal with, uh, with uh, Israel at the expense of the Palestinians. Now, Martin, I want to jump forward. The creation of the Palestinian uh, Authority following the discussions mm -hmm. in uh, Oslo, Madrid, mm -hmm. and then an agreement at Camp, uh, Camp David, uh, an agreement with Israel brokered by the United States, was it a step forward for the Palestinians? Well, y yes and no. I mean, I, I, I think, uh, as Kevin says, um, Arafat was negotiating, negotiating from a position of, of great weakness, and is, is it to his credit that he uh, forced the, uh, you know, forced the Americans to uh, and uh, to preside over this Oslo process. And on paper, of course, the deal, if if the Israelis had been sincere, the deal would have been a good one. It would have ended in 1999 with an independent Palestine. We, we would now be celebrating the 15th anniversary of the foundation of Palestine. Of course, uh, they they didn't do that. Um, after Rabin's death, they had no intention of doing it. Uh, he, he was, in a sense, uh, double-crossed by the uh, by the Israelis, uh, and, and so was the whole of Palestine. So I think it's while it's easy now to see that Oslo was a mistake because the guarantees weren't there. Of course, the guarantee was really the existence of Rabin being committed to to the process, and once he was gone, uh, there was nothing nothing to hold it together. So I don't blame him, but it, it, it is perfectly true that that um, Oslo, in retrospect, was a mistake because uh, it, it had the president of the Palestinian Authority's signature on an agreement uh, which leaked like anything. I mean, the, it simply didn't give the guarantees that, that uh, the Palestinians deserved. And Kevin, was this two-state solution a step forward? Like Martin puts it, it puts it very well. It, it, it was not a step forward, but um, there could have been a complete collapse in 1983. Uh, 1993, rather. If you look at what was happening internationally, the end of the Cold War, the swift victory by the West against uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, the El Salvadorian struggle collapses, the Nicaraguan struggle somehow is reversed. There's one retreat after another internationally. There could have been a complete collapse. He prevented that, but at a great price. I think uh, where serious mistakes were made were in overselling the Oslo Accord and in not giving sufficient room, even considering the position of weakness he was operating in, to the uh, dissonant Palestinian voices, which were not uh, extremist voices. These are, the, these are voices such as Edward Said, uh, Hanan Ashwari, people who rep were representative of the Palestinian enforced uh, diaspora, which are the biggest group of people to lose out from uh, Oslo. And the detachment of the Palestinian question from the Palestinian people and their sovereignty as a whole, which Oslo represented, was a serious, serious setback. Now, one of the things that Arafat did was, it's hard to remember, but pre-1967, 
The Labour Party in this country was largely pro-Israeli. The left actually was largely pro-Israeli. The Palestinians mm. had little support internationally. I mean, that was one of Arafat's achievements, if you like. He, he almost rebranded the Palestinians, did he not? He did indeed. I mean, one can remember a time when the default position on the left was to uh, support Israel and there was just a tiny band of people who who uh, saw the importance of um, Palestinian nation and Palestinian self-determination. So yes, um, Arafat over a period did, uh, did completely turn that around. But we're still not at the end of the process. I mean, uh, although the, the Labour Party is now much more supportive of Palestinian r human rights and self-determination uh, than, uh, you know, much more sympathy with that than with the Israeli cause, um, po uh, politicians as a whole are still um, still very resistant to the Palestinian uh, Palestinian nationhood, and, and although there's been a very, you know, decisive vote in the House of Commons in favour of recognition of Palestine, um, there are still still many politicians who are unconvinced uh, of the need for that. So, uh, you know, we still have a long way to go. But it was Yasser Arafat um, up until his death in 2004 that uh, begun the process of turning the uh, uh, Israelis from being um, the saviors to the problem and turning the Palestinians from being the problem to being the the, the nation that needed to be saved. But Kevin, some people might argue that the personalization of the Palestinian struggle around the, the very figure of Arafat was single man. It led to a sort of uh, uh, almost an autocracy inside the Palestinian organization by then. Do you agree with that? I don't agree with that. Where I think there is a case is that the West likes to have its uh, enemies in uh, cartoon form. And so to uh, personalize around a particular uh, demon in their case certainly played, um, played well for played well for them. Uh, I mean, you have to remember that uh, in the 1980s, an entire uh, UN General Assembly had to be transferred from New York to Geneva because the United States wouldn't allow Yasser Arafat a visa to enter, to enter the country. This was the degree of demonization. His role is not autocratic, but it was very, very central. He was a very skilled internal diplomat. He was able, throughout these years from 69 all the way through to his death, largely to keep the Islamist components, the more uh, leftist components, the nationalist components, the uh, small business, the big business and the impoverished masses largely together under the umbrella of the uh, of the PLO and that's not a difficult uh, that's not a, an easy thing to to do and so I don't think it was an autocracy around um, he himself what I do think is that the structure of the Palestinian Authority uh, which has come since does lend itself to uh, uh, power without responsibility. Kevin where do you think Yasser Arafat will stand in history? I think he'll stand as the at the uh, as the man who, at the point of the Palestinians' lowest ebb, which was after the Six Day War, with a wholesale retreat from positions which had been common to virtually all Arab leaders in the early 1960s, whether at least verbally common, whether they felt they had to say it under pressure or not, he was the man who prevented a, a complete collapse of morale of the physical presence and indeed of the historical destiny of the Palestinian people. So between 1967 and 1970, I think you can say without Yasser Arafat, the Palestinian struggle would have been severely weakened entering the decade of the 1970s. And Martin, you, where, where do you think Yasser Arafat's legacy stands? Well, I think uh, Kevin puts it very well. Uh, in the darkest hour, he was the one who kept the flame alive and, and, and uh, um, set them on the course to what I hope will eventually be uh, independence, uh, recognition, independence, uh, and a state of their own. And um, also, obviously, a solution of the Jerusalem uh, um, problem and, and, uh, and solution of the, of the refugee problem. Th these are all things that um, the Israelis earnestly hoped would be forgotten, buried, disappeared. Uh, and uh, it's thanks to Yasser Arafat that they are still very much on the agenda, not only on the agenda, but they are, I think the world is beginning to realize that they have to be solved. There is no way of uh, just allowing the Israelis to, to ride roughshod over the Palestinians any longer. But one of the problems we face since then, Martin, is, is that Arafat was the diplomat who held it together. Since Arafat's death, tragically, we've seen division inside the Palestinian movement.
Yes, and, and hopefully the 10th uh, anniversary of his death on, on, the, on the 11th of November will be an uh, occasion for a great unifying demonstration in Gaza uh, and um, underlining the, the unity that they have now recently found again, because it, it, it has been a very sad chapter uh, in Palestinian history. The uh, the estrangement of uh, Fatah and Hamas and the problems, the, gr the great weakening of the, the of the Palestinian movement that it has caused, uh, and it lasted seven years, and it, it now appears to be coming to an end. And maybe the tenth anniversary will help to heal those wounds because it's it's essential for the. Uh, for the Palestinians to um, to be able to present a united front. I mean, it's one of the great paradoxes of um, liberation struggles that you do need unity uh, during the process of the struggle uh, to nationhood, uh, but you also need democracy. Uh, and, um, you know, Fatah and Hamas on one level are, are two different parties with different views, different policies, uh, as we, you know, every country has. But at the same time, they're both part of what should be a united national liberation struggle. And so they need to both show unity and diversity. And it, it is very difficult. But uh, I think uh, I hope that this time they have succeeded. And there's no doubt that the absence of Yasser Arafat uh, contributed enormously to this division. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. And thank you for joining us on this programme marking the death of Yasser Arafat 10 years ago on the 11th of November. Yasser Arafat's legacy will continue to be a subject of controversy for years to come. But I hope you found this discussion informative and useful. And thank you for joining us.